Welcome to this edition of Decoding Diplomacy. In this program, uh, I interview eminent diplomats, experts, and newsmakers to discuss, decode, and demystify global affairs and issues, especially those which have a bearing on India's interest and its rise as a major global player. Today, my guest is Dr. Aparna Pandey, and we're going to talk about the elections in the most powerful country in the world and how it will impact India's core interest and the trajectory of the India-US relationship, which President Obama has famously called the defining partnership of the 21st century. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aparna Pandey. She's a research fellow at Hudson Institute. A major field of interest is South Asia, with a special focus on India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, foreign policy and security. Dr. Pandey has contributed to many prestigious publications. She has written highly acclaimed books, including explaining Pakistan's foreign policy, escaping India from Chanakya to Modi, evolution of India's foreign policy, and making India great, the promise of a reluctant uh, superpower. Welcome to the show, Aparna. Uh, you know, we are meeting at a time when the buzz is growing louder about the elections in the United States. Uh, the guessing game is on and all the frenzy. About 64 countries in the world are holding elections this year. And the world's two largest democracies will also be holding the elections. The elections in the United States, the world's wealthiest and uh, most powerful country, are being watched the world over. Because in some ways, uh, the world is kind of uh, vested there, you know, uh, intertwined with what happens in America. Uh, either directly or tangentially. So my first question is this, that how do you look at, uh, going by latest indicators, uh, I don't expect you to be an astrologer, but as of now, who is leading, uh, Joe Biden or uh, Donald Trump? Over to you, Abad. Uh, thank you, Manish. Pleasure to be here. I'd say it is a neck to neck still, and we'll have to wait till November. Um, it's going to be a closely fought election right, like 2020. So we may have to wait till election day or a few days after to actually know. Um, so as of now, it's a neck to neck. It's a polarized country and a polarized society. Uh, we'll have to wait till November to know. All right. So uh, yes, we will wait for the November 2024. Uh, but in the meantime, how do you look at the prospects of uh, a Trump presidency? I mean, if you take a big picture view, uh, what does uh, Trump 2.0 presidency would mean for India's core interest, especially at a time when India is carving its own place and its own voice in the international arena. So, um, Manisha, India has an advantage. There is a word is called geopolitical sweet spot. Uh, India is one of those few countries where there's bipartisan consensus among Democrats and Republicans. Every president going back to President Clinton has visited India, including President Trump. Um, and sort of, you know, under President Trump, uh, the sort of, you know, the Indo-Pacific strategy was started, uh, Quad restarted, um, you know, sort of, so relations with India were strong even under President Trump. The problems will come in some of the details that I'm sure you and I will discuss in a little while. But overall for India, it doesn't matter who the American president is because India is important geopolitically, economically, in the security realm. Um, sort of, you know, the values-based relationship. And so every part and every sphere, India will remain relevant. There will be some tensions and some frictions. Uh, there will be some differences between the Biden and the Trump presidency. Uh, and I'm sure you and I will discuss those. But as sort of, you know, in the big picture, as long as China remains the, the, the main peer competitor of the United States, and as long as India continues to grow economically and carve out its space in the in Asia and Indo-Pacific um, and stick to its democratic principles, the India-US relationship will continue down the path that it has up till now. Right. Uh, talking about the economic relationship, you know, economic partnership, trade and investment is probably one of the strongest pillars of the multifaceted India-US relationship. And over there, uh, there is a good news story which is still unfolding. Uh, we are close to, we are done around $190 billion bilateral trade. And, uh, you know, it is still way below the target set earlier of $500 billion. Uh, probably we need to accelerate all that. But 
is looking still very good. Uh, in the realm of trade and investment, uh, some people in India have slight what we call Trump anxiety that uh, Trump's America will be a more protectionist America, that uh, Trump, President Trump would be more aggressive, transactional, and extract his pound of flesh, as it were. Uh, how do you look at these uh, concerns and anxieties relating to Trump's trade policies? So I'd say some of them are justified, uh, but sort of, you know, India has advantages and can always work around them. Yes, uh, sort of, you know, the U.S. has turned more protectionist since the, pres the Trump presidency. It continues at some level, even under the Biden presidency. Uh, India has always been protectionist as well. And so there are two countries which are protectionist, which are dealing with each other. However, trade has increased. It increased on the Trump and the Biden presidency. Um, the problems which India will face or potentially may face under a Trump 2.0 would be one that, you know, sort of in negotiations of any kind, one normally sort of both countries prefer or both individuals prefer win-win so that each right. side can claim that they got something out of that transaction. When it is a right. win-lose or a zero-sum, which very right. often happened under the Trump presidency, that creates a problem and prevents, you know, small deals, mini trade deals. You know, Harley Davidson was an example. The withdrawal right. of India's GSP Plus was another example. Right, However, right, right. at the same time, the desire to sort of, you know, have to, to demonstrate something on the trade front may result in some small mini trade deal happening if only okay. for symbolic reasons. So one can never rule that out. The yeah, bigger yeah. problem which I worry about and one doesn't have an answer for it right now is uh -huh. how invested would the Trump presidency be in sharing technology in civilian and defense space with India without a quid pro quo which was visible? Right. Uh, no, it's uh, not. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was saying no, that, that yeah, by and yeah. large, American presidents, um, including whether it was uh, sort of, you know, President Trump, Biden, have believed that India's economic and security rise is good for the United States, irrespective right, right. of which path India takes. India's rise right. is important. I'm mm -hmm. not as right. certain that you, the, the Trump presidency saw it that way. They saw it more as transactional, not necessarily as it's good that India rises and we must help India rise. So that would be a difference between the Biden sort of, you know, strategic or, uh, mm -hmm. sort of outlook and the pre and the Trump more, you know, sort of uh, more inward looking uh, outlook. Right, right, right. Uh, so, I mean, you're right. You have hit the hammer and the nail. Uh, uh, you know, Modi's, you know, we come to the, uh, you know, the larger strategic economic convergence, you know. Uh, that is, uh, Modi's pursuit, make in India policy, and he's pitching, he goes around the world and pitching for investment, and he says, come make in India. And Trump says the same thing, America first policy, you want more jobs for Americans. So it's a, it's a kind of an insular America, it's like me first, essentially. Uh, where do you see the convergence? Do you think this would be, this is a vision issue, you know, will it be a source of friction in a possible, in a potential uh, Trump administration? It does have the potential, but it can also be a workaround. I mean, there is the China, there, there is a China factor uh, from sort of, you know, from the Trump presidency onwards, China as the peer competition and rivalry has grown. So sort of, you know, in that context, um, you know, sort of American companies coming back home and manufacturing is, of course, ideal. But if mm -hmm. companies are not coming back, it is better that they come to partners and allies. And those mm -hmm. partners and allies would be India, would be Vietnam, would be countries in Southeast Asia, would be Japan. So Japanese and South Korean companies, Taiwanese companies. But sort of, you know, and so in the broader geopolitical uh, context, sort of, you know, companies sort of investing in India or coming to India. Uh, would be acceptable. We have to remember, it was under the, the Trump presidency that the, the U.S. national security strategy placed so much of emphasis on India, the 2017 strategy. Um, and while, you know, sort of this, the 
protectionism plays a role um the desire to push back against china and the desire to ensure that china is not benefiting will at some level create some opportunity for india but we will have to wait and see we have to remember that this is the second this will be the second presidency and by default the last presidency for for president trump if he wins which would mean that he wants to leave a legacy and we'll have to see what he chooses to leave as his legacy is it right. picture, is it small picture is it you know sort of just trade is it something else and we don't know with someone like him what what is it that he wants to leave as his legacy well i think that's a very uh, interesting point and we'll come to uh, the point about trump's legacy towards the end of our conversation but you spoke about china factor and now you see uh, what we are having a uh, situation where there is a robust bipartisan consensus in favor of developing stronger and diverse relations with india on one hand and on the other hand you have very strong bipartisan consensus in in, in the united states on deterring china on containing china <clears throat> on basically not letting china run away with the game so to speak coming to the china factor going by you know it was trump who hardened the stance and you know biden was supposed to be biden has continued president biden has continued with a, a very aggressive assertive stance on china do you see any prospect of a us china rapprochement at all either under biden or trump in the next uh, uh, four years you know because we are calling it uh, kind of india us 2025 and beyond what are we looking at going ahead so um in geopolitics you sort of you know it is difficult to say whether or not something will happen but sort of as of now sort of the chances that either biden 2.0 or trump 2.0 will have a what sort of what india used to always fear call a g2 which is in the us and china dividing up the world and china mm-hmm. getting asia and us that part sort of that yeah, is right. difficult right now for president mm-hmm. trump it will be difficult because most of his base and most of his you know sort of his trade rhetoric and his geopolitical his security rhetoric is all china focused it is not russia focused it is china mm-hmm. focused right. um right, and so right. that is reco- important to the protectionism the desire to bring things back home the sort of is all china focused now sort of you know similarly for president for, for the by for the biden administration it is russia and china and china is the peer competitor the technology the sort of trying to ensure that china does not get access to you know high end chips high end technology high end defense equipment all of that is important and so both of them china will remain important for one china and russia are equally important for one china is more important now that does not mean as we have seen in the biden administration there is a desire to ensure that there is no war or conflict so they have been they want a basic conversation with china to continue on the economic or defense fronts or hotlines to continue mm-hmm. um and that will continue in the in biden 2.0 India too does not want a conflict with China. India does not want mm-hmm. a global conflict. I mean, there are those mm-hmm. those countries which would like to manage its relationship with China. Mm-hmm. We don't want mm-hmm. a conflict between U.S. China or between India China. So the sort of you know Biden 2.0 or Trump 2.0 may have conversations with China about you know sort of ensuring that you know how do we allow the basic trade which happens um how do we ensure that there is no conflict between an american or a chinese jet uh discussions on taiwan um i'm sure you're following that the the japanese prime minister is supposed to come to the united states and the treaty the japan china us treaty is going to be upgraded uh, right so so china will remain but will there be in 2.0 a desire to sort of you know smooth out the rough edges and ensure that there is no conflict absolutely no country wants conflict in today's day and age 
so they may right. try to make sure that things don't get worse but the peer competition and rivalry continues for one basic reason mm -hmm. us grand strategy dating back to the end of the second world war has been mm -hmm. predicted on one principle that the us will not allow another competitor to rise on the global stage first it was soviet union now it is china so it is a, it is antithetical to american national security interest to have a competitor which can mm -hmm. at some stage upstage the united states uh, right so uh, so you know on the china threat uh, as as we discussed uh, there is a, a, a strong consensus that china cannot be uh, allowed to uh, to 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 dominate the world as the next power so to speak and this is the larger grand strategy some say that it is this that drives you know the china factor that drives uh, according to you know the american calculation this uh, deepening partnership or the desire to take india us partnership to the next level china is the animating factor do you agree with that assessment and so there is a fear or there are concerns from time to time in the strategic circles in india what if us and china way to make up then what happens uh, will india us edifice of india's relationship will remain as strong as uh, before uh, manish i'll throw the question in a very different way back to you but i will answer it mm -hmm. what about uh, what if people say if india and china make up then will india still want a strong relationship with the united states should the united states mm -hmm. fear that india will after elections make up with china and therefore no longer want to be part, part of quad and indo pacific and i to u to in malabar mm -hmm. no um sort of you know at some level both will these fears remain absolutely both countries mm -hmm. have a, have a right to fear but i mean i am one of those who believes that sort of you know the india us relationship at its core is not china based at its core mm -hmm. it is values based and a values based partnership always outlives an interest based mm -hmm. partnership interests mm -hmm. can change right you know, it was cold war it was soviet union then it was china right if it was mm -hmm. always one thing then in sort of just as pakistan is not relevant today india would mm -hmm. have not been relevant today but the united mm -hmm. states has wanted a relationship with with india dating back to pre partition when president mm -hmm. yar wanted a relationship with india and that is almost right. 77 years now through right. cold war end of cold war war on terror post war on terror that relationship mm -hmm. has continued because there is a belief that these are two democracies which have similar visions of the of the global architecture which mm -hmm. want similar things and they may be mm -hmm. in different geographies and have different you know sort of threats and concerns but overall agree on what the mm -hmm. globe should be or the global architecture should be so i believe they right. binding the two countries it is not just china but does china play a role absolutely the reason that india is seen as the china plus one on the commercial front on the defense technology front does matter it is helping india it is helping india build its defense cooperation and collaboration and its defense architecture it's helping india on the commercial front it is helping the united states so right. you know interests matter sort of you know and, and so they are helping both countries can they change mm -hmm. maybe maybe in mm -hmm. you know in some in some years they will but at, right now us china remains the peer competitor for in, for united states and for india china is the country sitting on indian territory and laying the traditional indian territory right, so right. both countries china matters i think that's very well explained and especially the point about uh, interest base and value base that china is the is an important factor but it's not the sole overriding factor that is driving the the, the two strategic partners Uh, to deepen their partnership now coming to another issue which is uh, very newsy which is about united states problematic relationship with russia and russia is in the news for all the wrong reasons right now uh, and here again uh, this is a source of uh, concern for uh, india 
that if two of his strategic partners get along well or create some sort of you know modus by vending you know some sort of uh, coexistence some sort of deal it would be good for india do you see you know going by you know what trump was very fond of putin i don't know what exactly that means but at least that's the kind of rhetoric he kind of created how do you look at a, a potential trump president what would it mean for united states russia relations and by extension how would it impact india so um president trump's getting along with putin notwithstanding us russia relations did not improve during the pres the trump presidency and it right. did not stop president uh, putin from invading ukraine now india and russia's india and us relations on russia will differ have differed will differ and will always differ um right. it has to do with geography nothing right. else for india russia or soviet union was the counter to china and so russia was important on the strategic pole it still remains uh for the united states russia is soviet union it is mm -hmm. the you know decades of cold war post cold war and the russian us relationship which is not going to improve any time soon unless there's a change there also for the in the last sort of since the pre since president trump was president russia china relationship has improved and russia has become more dependent on china and That's so true. even if he sort of there's a you know he may like president putin it will not change the russia china relationship and so mm -hmm. irrespective of who is the president in november of this year um the us relationship and the us view of russia um as a bad actor and the russia china relationship as codependent will continue and india's right. challenge will remain because from for india a russia that is weak a russia that is dependent on china reminds us of pre 99 pre 1966 sino soviet relations we must remember that in 1962 the soviet union did not side with us it sided with china because so, they were together at that time so mm -hmm. for india india's biggest nightmare would be a russia which is so dependent on china that it that it no longer supports india provides spare parts or says anything which is antithetical to china right so going by that logic a uh, uh, us russia thaw would help india so that will prevent uh, russia would, over dependence so that china. would be difficult to happen because of you know sort of it if there was no russia ukraine war then a trump 2.0 may have been able to you know sort of ease things you know mm -hmm. even if let's say that un, that trump come president come comes back and the amount of assistance being given to ukraine is cut down yeah. that mm -hmm. still will not change the in the russia us relationship mm -hmm. we have to understand right. that the american establishment does not view russia as a good actor the indian establishment may true So right. you know, there's a fundamental disconnect there's a fundamental disconnect so it is not it's like yeah. you know very often used to happen with pakistan right us mm -hmm. us pakistan relationship is different from india pakistan relationship the us cannot right. convince india of of how pakistan helped united states and india for right. decades it took india decades to convince the united states of pakistan's bad act, actions so sometimes right. different geographies and different yeah. views of a country can do not change simply because two actors become friends india and us right. friendship does not change us views of russia or indian views of russia right uh, but i use specialize in pakistan and we have a new government in pakistan right now and uh, president biden has written to the new prime minister kind of uh, you know triggering all sorts of speculation and you know this is another area you know which is it's no longer so prominent in india's foreign policy calculus because some or other pakistan factor has lost its salience or no longer have the same salience but at the same time uh, do you think us and pakistan are heading for some sort of accommodation establishment and what would that mean for india again we are talking of 
the current administration and also Biden 2.0 and Trump 2.0. So, um, Manish, I believe diplomatic dialogue does not mean diplomatic reset. Just because I say hello to Manish does not change, you know, my relationship and the fundamentals. So, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship today, sort of, you know, a few years ago or a few years from now, will not be the U.S.-Pakistan relationship of the 1960s, the 1980s, or the 2000s. Because right. there is no Cold War, there is no war on terror, there is there are no American troops in Afghanistan. Um, and so there is nothing that Pakistan is offering the United States. So let's look at what are right. American concerns today and under Biden 2.0 or Trump 2.0. China, where does Pakistan fall on the China calculus? It is a close China partner and ally going back to the 1950s. Mm -hmm. They share technology, right. military and civilian. Pakistan mm -hmm. supports China. Pakistan has never done anything against China. So if Pakistan does not come in Indo-Pacific or in any of the American calculations vis-a-vis -vis China, right? Mm -hmm. right? Second, the commercial. What is the US-Pakistan you know, annual bilateral trade? 12 billion dollars. That is the amount of trade that the United States has with Morocco. That is the right. extent of commercial trade. Okay. That's a good example. Um, yeah. Sort of third, let's look at, you know, sort of, there, there are no values based partnerships. There are, there is no, there isn't, there is a Pakistani diaspora, uh, less than a mm -hmm. million, but it doesn't play the role. And so values, interests, commerce, Defense, again, defense security are not what they used to be. There is sort of, you know, uh, there's a basic training program which goes on. But mm -hmm. if you look at mm -hmm. the amount of aid which the U.S. gives Pakistan, that aid is right. definitely, it's, you know, climate finance, flood relief, you know, health care, um, you know, basic sort of, you know, there is very little American investment. So on any of these parameters, Pakistan does not form Sort of, there's nothing which binds. But yes, it is a country with nuclear weapons. It is a country in a part of the world which the U.S. cares about, right next to India, right next to China, next to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Iran, mm -hmm. on the Persian Gulf. It right. is a country which has a number of jihadi groups. So if you are United States, if they you want to make sure that there's a basic relationship with the country so that nothing gets worse, so President Biden's letter, if you saw the letter, was very sort of, it, it was brief to the point. It did not congratulate. It did not, it talked about a relationship, but in healthcare and climate and energy. It didn't talk mm -hmm. about counterterrorism, didn't talk about strategic, it didn't talk about defense. Mm -hmm. And I think it was basically an attempt to say that, yes, we want a relationship with you, but nothing more. Now you have to bear in mind, Sort of President mm -hmm. Trump actually invited Imran Khan uh, to the White House. He, President Trump has even offered when he was president to negotiate between India and Pakistan and resolve the Kashmir yes. dispute. Something which That's the Biden administration has avoided. They haven't, right. haven't invited to the White House. They haven't mm -hmm. said anything on Kashmir. And so right. in many ways, Biden 2.0 will continue with Biden 1.0. Sort of, right. is it possible that the president meets the Pakistani prime minister, maybe. U.S. presidents have met Pakistani prime ministers. President That's right. It doesn't mean really much. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. President Biden met yeah. Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif in 2022 on the sidelines of the U.N. Right, right, but right. that, I mean, it's, right. at the end of the day, it's not meeting. He meets lots mm -hmm. of many, many presidents and prime right. ministers. What right, is right. the relationship? What's the economic and commercial? What's the defense? What's the strategic mm -hmm. partnership? That's what matters. Uh, Dr. Pandey, you know, coming to uh, the more recent, uh, you know, some irritants uh, very briefly, and you know what I'm talking about, uh, what is really a kind of uh, a cause of uh, uh, irritation for the Indian establishment, the ruling establishment here is the, the Democrats' preachiness, you know, the, the activism we see on human rights issue, the kind of sermonizing, uh, uh, we saw coming from the United States on the arrest of Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal, 
And linked up with that, of course, there are two different issues, and we can come to the Panoon issue later. But very briefly, is it appropriate when, you know, this happened last, uh, during the time of uh, Trump as well, you know, this uh, intrusiveness, you know, commenting on internal affairs of other countries, where some would say that even the American system is kind of broken. And we saw that in uh, the siege, the famous Trump siege at the Capitol Hill. Uh, so what do you make out of it? Is this a good trend? So I mean, how what does it mean for relations? You know. So I'll say three things here, Manish. First, sort of, you know, India and the US are both democracies. They are public, uh, chaotic, um, sort of, you know, vociferous, um, you know, democracies where people disagree with each other and disagree with each other openly and publicly. Sure. And that has happened across the decades. This is not the first time that either country has said something about the other country. We can go back to the Cold War. We can go back to sort of uh, those in the U.S. who say India has a tendency to preach and moralize as well. And so sort of, you know, it's sort of it applies on both sides. We are countries and we are people who express our opinion and express in public. Number two, the positive side is that the two countries are friends. And so it is better to voice in public rather than keep holding a grudge for decades and then let that come out. Always better to say to friends when you disagree with them. And remember, India, US disagree on many things. They disagree on Russia. They disagree on Pakistan. They disagree on, you know, we come to the Pannu issue, terror, what is terrorism? They disagree on many issues and yet they keep talking to each other. You know, right. so despite all of this, you know, the the two plus two has continued, quad continues, the you know, sort of the, the Congress's notification of the MQ-9 Reaper drone has continued. The GE jet engine continues. So there will be disagreements in public. It is democracy. It's not an autocracy where it is only behind doors. The third mm -hmm. thing, right. the U.S. system is very different from the American, from the Indian system. The Indian system, the legislature and executive work together because the executive comes out of the legislature, the political executive. Uh, so in the American system, the legislature, executive are different and separate. So the Congress, what the Congress, the hearings the Congress has and what the Congress does is very different and maybe totally opposite to what the administration may want, but the administration cannot stop the Congress from doing it. Finally, coming right. to this, I would say that, you know, uh, it, has, it has long been a part of American foreign policy to talk about human rights, democracy, religious freedom, sort of, you know, and sort of, you know, with, and with elections happening all across the world, we will see this when it comes to every country, whether it was Bangladesh, whether it was Pakistan, whether it is India, whether it is later Sri Lanka, or any other part of the world. It is natural and it will happen. One may disagree with it and one mm -hmm. may say that, you know, you should not do this. But that is something which has always happened. The U.S., the State Department has always come out and sort of commented on elections and commented on democracy uh, in other countries. This is not new. The only reason that we are, that this has been five years since India had elections. And so that's why this is the first time, you know, sort of people are remembering it. People also have short memory on social media. Mm -hmm. And they forget mm -hmm. that it happens each time. Mm -hmm. um, right. And because the relationship with the U.S. is stronger, there's a presumption mm -hmm. that because we are so close to you, you will not comment on things. Right, right. It's not how it happens. It, sort That's of the comments true. will continue. Okay. Okay, but now coming to the Panon issue, you know, yes. that has really caused a lot of heartburns here, you know. Yeah. Uh, that uh, the question being asked uh, is that should a close strategic partner be behaving like this? That's number one. Duplicity on the issue of terrorism under the guise of human rights and all that. There's a sense of befuddlement. There's a sense of being let down uh, among sections of 
the so-called chattering classes and the diplomatic establishment as well, uh, that, uh, you know, Americans are taking it a bit too far. And, uh, linked, and, and you saw the remarks of Ambassador Garcetti, uh, he was ambassador mm -hmm. to India, where he said the red line has been crossed. And that uh, phrase has been used by Secretary of State, others in the U.S. Has the red line been crossed, according to you? And could, could, and my question is this, and there's a sense here that probably Trump, to Trump, these issues will not matter so much. This is typical of democratic no, activism. I Do you agree with that? I, I won't agree on that part. No, I won't. Mm -hmm. um, so let me sort of divide this into three things. One, um, mm -hmm. there are there are two different parts of the Pannu issue. One is the sort of you know the extremism within certain segments of the of the Sikh diaspora, um, mm -hmm. and actually three years ago, Hudson brought out a report on this. We brought out a report on Khalistani extremism uh, in the United States. And we traced its origins going back decades. Uh, the support from Pakistan, the links between the Pakistani intelligence and these extremists, and the Kashmiri uh, groups and these extremists as well. Mm -hmm. And we had warned three years ago that if the US law and order and national security do not keep a check on these, on these groups and these individuals, it will cause a rift in India-US relations. Um, so... Yes, there is that part, which is there are segments, small segments of the Sikh diaspora who espouse Khalistan, you know, and there are those who espouse it just as, you know, in a peaceful manner, but there are many who do not. And sort of, you know, there is that part. And that is something which U.S. national security, U.S. law and order and national security establishment has to take, sort of, you know, do a better job of, sort of, you know, acting against them, following them and tracking them like they did in the 1990s. And they haven't done that. The second mm -hmm. part has to do with what, what is called the murder for hire incident, which is, you know, what happened last year, uh, not just the, what happened in Canada, but what the attempted uh, killing of Pannu in, uh, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Now, that part, um, the U.S. sort of, you know, establishment is very... Uh, upset about. And here I would say it doesn't matter whether it is Biden or Trump. And I'll tell you why. The U.S. Mm -hmm. has always been very, very particular about any mm -hmm. of its citizens being mm -hmm. hurt, put in harm's mm -hmm. way or killed. So the mm -hmm. U.S. has, you know, spent dollars and billions of dollars and mm -hmm. dipl diplomatic resources to get its citizens out of countries. So mm -hmm. would it be willing to allow a citizen be killed on its own soil? No, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. And if it was the former president, there may have been multiple tweets about it. The difference right. is there are no tweets by the president mm -hmm. at the top administration. Right. And so that right. part has been, India has been saved the, those tweets which would have come at right. random right. Right. But sort of the, the fact that in, uh, there was an, an attempted killing of an American citizen is what is problematic. Now, the two, India and the U.S. disagree on who Pannu was, you know, how Pannu should be dealt with. But that isn't what, what the American system is upset about. It isn't whether or not Pannu is a terrorist or not. It is that why did a friendly country try to kill an American citizen on American soil? That is what mm -hmm. is, that's what Ambassador Garcetti was referring to. And that's what the indictment, which has been released publicly, refers to. And that's what the, the Congress was, sort of, you know, the hearings on the Congress, which took place, on the mm -hmm. Hill, which took place. And that mm -hmm. is... The issue is a friendly country trying to kill an American citizen on American soil. Uh, so, you know, I mean, uh, we, I understand that, you know, this is something on which there will be no meeting of minds no. as far as the establishment is concerned, because it's one man's uh, terrorist can be another person's citizen and all that. So we get into the realm of uh, moral relativity, ambiguity and all that. Uh, so... Uh, now, coming to a very basic question, we'll end with that. We can go on for a few more hours, but unfortunately, we don't have the luxury for that. 
is a larger moving beyond India. And very briefly, uh, you know, so there's something we did when we started our magazine journal uh, five, six years, seven years ago. The first cover story was the Trump anxiety. That was the time the first Trump presidency took place. And I was at Munich Security Conference, and then we had here our own Raisina dialogue, a lot of international conferences. And that's the question people are asking, you know, what Trump means for the world. Uh, will Trump subvert, wreck, will he again start insulting uh, European allies, ask them not to have a joyride on American power, you know, piggyback and all that. So are we going to see more of that? Or do you see Trump, a four years out of power, is a slightly changed man and be, be, and he would not be indulging in the same excesses, so to speak? So, um, so what does it mean? You know, I mean, will America be yeah, in concrete terms? This way. It is easier to yeah. predict a Biden 2.0 than it is to predict a Trump 2.0. Because in right. Biden 2.0, sort of, you know, there's a predictability. You know which way right. things will go. With the Trump 2.0, right. they sort of, you know, there is a uh, there is a fear. Now, the rest of the world is fearing, especially Europe and Asia. And so people are trying to protect themselves. That what if Trump 2.0 means little support for NATO? So let us, you know, sort of get sort of reassure Europe and let European security, let Europeans build their own security. You know, Japan is going to get an upgraded uh, U.S.-Japan yeah. uh, alliance, sort of, you know, treaty. Uh, South Korea, Taiwan, countries in Asia. So mm. whether or not President sort of Trump 2.0 will mean a sort of, you know, more of Trump 1.0 means everybody needs to pay more. They need to do more and the U.S. will do less is the greater likelihood that that will happen. Uh, but with Pre Trump being so unpredictable, there's the equal possibility that his focus is all domestic. Um, mm -hmm. That's right. is, and he lets the professionals run foreign policy except for certain areas. So you will have to wait and see. The domestic focus will be much more because there's a lot that, you know, sort of concerns. So on the protectionist side, trade side, immigration, one thing you and I did not touch is immigration. And if you remember right. last time, he had cut down on the work visas, green right. card, citizenships, mm -hmm. which will all affect India. Plus, 100,000 right. illegal Indians cross the border every year from Mexico now. That was not so mm -hmm. under, under a few years ago. And so now right. India comes in the category of countries who have illegal immigrants entering the United States. Right. That's an important issue. Immigration yes. will, be, will be a problem. And immigration is domestic. Mm -hmm. Trade is domestic. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So uh, a more insular uh, uh, America, and that's another concern that, Absolutely. you know, uh, a, a potential uh, Trump presidency would also mean a dilution of America's commitment to multilateralism. Yes. yes. That walking out of the trade deal, uh, sorry, climate deal, you know, uh, like Trump did, and more of that we'll see, uh, which is not quite, uh, uh, not, not great news for those no. who are trying to no. revive no. multilateralism. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's try to sum it up. And I would sum it, uh, try to sum it up, as in I would like you to sum it up uh, under the rubric of legacy. Uh, which you spoke about earlier. So let's talk about briefly that uh, for both President Trump and Biden, for both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, if they win, then this will be their second shot at the most powerful job in the world. So we're talking about two, Biden 2.0 and Trump 2.0. How would they like to? What kind of legacy you think start with Trump and, and start with someone as seasoned, as a, such a veteran diplomat, uh, as Joe Biden. So what is the legacy briefly they would like to leave behind? So for, and also in terms of India, you know. Yeah. 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 So for yeah. both sort of at some level, David, there is a domestic legacy, for mm -hmm. but different domestic legacies. For, for mm -hmm. Biden 2.0, it would be, you know, leaving a better America on the economic front, infrastructure, mm -hmm. climate, women's issues you know, mm -hmm. uh, abortion and all of those, uh, you know, sort of minority rights, 
So, you know, sort of more democracy, but small d democracy, uh, more mm -hmm. human rights, more water rights, infrastructure. So rebuilding America at some level. Uh, mm -hmm. But Biden 2.0 would also want to continue supporting Ukraine, mm -hmm. Taiwan, China mm -hmm. as the, the main threat with Russia, and sort of, you know, bolster the Indo-Pacific and the relationship with India. So it could lead to sort of, you know, more economic investment, more technology sharing, more cooperation on the defense and strategic realm. Because for President, for Biden, India remains important. It is a country mm -hmm. he has always wanted to build a relationship with for strategic reasons. Right. Right. Trump 2.0 will be domestic, but it will be domestic mm -hmm. more on the immigration, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of, you know, protectionism, um, you know, um, sort of at some level also suppression of, you know, sort of at some level, you know, uh, suppression of organizations or people who, who sort of, who were against Trump. So they will be, you know, sort of um, certain, you know, sort of, um, and sort of, you know, um, in some ways trying to, um, you know, help the people who were part of January 6th or, or others get away and things like that. So it's a little more domestic focused on areas which matter to him. His court cases, mm -hmm. if they are there or not there, rebuilding um, things for himself. On the foreign policy front, it will be important for him to try and get some kind of, you know, um, China will remain important, um, mm -hmm. but support for NATO, for other countries, mm -hmm. be contingent on what those countries or those groupings are willing mm -hmm. to do for the United States. Um, right. Won't be that much of a foreign policy except in protectionism trade or in the case of you know pushing back against china it is going to be a more isolationist america it is going to be a more inward looking america um except for random things like north korea is of interest to him so he may want to do something there he may want to do something in the middle east to support israel um you know sort of with respect to india it will all depend on um sort of sort of you know he has a good view of india and prime minister modi as long mm -hmm. as sort of they are sort of there is nothing which somebody brings to him which which is about mm -hmm. india on the trade front or immigration front things will continue but his his uh, he may not be as generous in offering mm -hmm. technology and economic mm -hmm. investment as the biden administration and what about personal chemistry? Very briefly, you think Modi has a better chemistry with one or the other, or is it the same vibe? I think it's the same. I think sort of yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think sort of he had a good chemistry with President Obama also. So I think the right. chemistry has remained the same. So to sum up, uh, regardless of who is in the White House post November two thousand twenty-four, the the trajectory of the India-U.S. partnership will be on an upward curve regardless of who is there. And it seems that the larger consensus, which is not just about the party, which is to uh, spur the rise of India, not just as a counterweight to China, but also as a force for good in the world. I think that commitment uh, will continue regardless of who is in power in America. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Parna Pandey, for this uh, uh, excellent, insightful, wide-ranging, you know, we spoke about just, uh, uh, just about everything. Uh, and of course, some important subject we'll keep for our later uh, conversations. So thank you once again. Uh, thank you. So la ladies and gentlemen, we will be publishing this interview on our website, www.indiaride.org. So goodbye for now. We'll catch up again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.